What today's panel is addressing is the triple bottom line, and more importantly, how social entrepreneurs can achieve the triple bottom line. And so during uh, our goals today, we have three goals. And the first is to inspire. We want to inspire everyone here to start to think about how you can implement this, this into your organizations and into your businesses and into your lives. Our second goal is to educate. We want to provide a framework, a roadmap, if you will, for how you can start to think about how to implement some of this stuff. And then our third goal is to encourage. I want to encourage all of you to become part of the growing chorus of voices talking about sustainability in Pensacola and Northwest Florida. Uh, when you're out there talking to people and talking to businesses that are <coughs> focusing only in on the short-term measure of profitability, you can mention, you know, there's another way to do this, a way that focuses on improving the lives of the people, improving the lives of the planet. And by the way, when you do that successfully, it usually increases profitability as well. So since I tend to get very excited about this subject, it's important to have a little bit of structure. So peering into the future, I see that over the next hour, hour and 15 minutes, we're gonna talk a little bit about the triple bottom line. We're gonna do a quick interactive exercise, and then we'll launch into the panel discussion. And by 1.15, 1.20 the latest, we'll wrap that up, we'll have a quick uh, announcement about what's coming up next, and then I hope you'll all follow us downstairs to get some desserts and coffee courtesy of Spencer and Associates. All right. So, launching right into the presentation. In our previous Lunch and Learn, we talked about the evolution of corporate social responsibility. From the well-known idea of corporate philanthropy all the way to, through to the idea of social enterprise. And the basic idea behind all of these is that businesses have a role to play in making the world a better place. I think that's worth repeating, right? Businesses have a role to play in making the world a better place. And that role can range from donating to a local cause all the way through to creating a new separate entity that sole purpose is to solve a social issue while generating a profit. And traditionally, the only way that success of these was measured is through profitability. Um, that's the financial bottom line. But the drawback of this is that that tends to be a short-term measure, and it usually needs to be maximized for the sake of, of the shareholders. And, but companies that are engaged in creating shared value in these newer social enterprises uh, require more inclusive language for how to measure their outcomes. And that's where the idea of the triple bottom line comes in. So what is the triple bottom line? It's essentially a framework that attempts to gauge an organization's performance on three major outcomes. And that's usually called the triple bottom line, the three P's, people, planet, and profits. The people bottom line is typically referring to the social impact of an organization. This is measuring how well employees are cared for, how well the raw material producers down your supply chain are cared for, and what impacts the decisions an organization makes has on the communities in which they work. And there's a great example of this that I found in Dublin, Ireland. It's a company called uh, Void Starter. And basically, what they, they have a high unemployment rate there among youth, and so what they're doing is they're taking empty housing units and they're turning them into short-term learning centers and entrepreneurial labs. And so what they do is they teach these kids to create new social enterprises that solve other issues in the community, and they put them to work, and, and they're just having this amazing impact, right? But you can't just measure that on profitability. It, it totally misses the essence. So by focusing on a people bottom line, you start to bring in a broader understanding of how this company is performing. then the planet bottom line refers to the impact on the environment that an organization has. It asks questions like how much waste are we producing, how well is it mitigated, how much greenhouse gases and you know, carbon are we emitting into the atmosphere, and then even better questions are like how much of that are we taking out of the environment. And an example of this locally, an excellent example, is Lamar Outdoor Advertising. The company is literally a pioneer in the area of sustainability within the outdoor advertising industry. So, they're doing things like investing in energy efficient lighting, uh, they're recycling all the billboard plastics that they produce, they're, you've seen their, their solar panels all over the state here, pretty amazing stuff. And globally there's endless examples of this and the reason for that 
is because companies are one that's being demanded by the shareholders and their employees, but also they're learning that by investing in the planet, they're actually uh, starting to see an actual net increase in profitability. And then the profits, I think we all pretty much know what that is. This is the bottom line of the income statement showing how much money is left after all the expenses are paid. And do not want to diminish this. It's a very important measure. Without it, the others aren't possible. But of course, what we really care about is this area where the three uh, measures over, overlap. When a company manages its social responsibilities, its environmental impacts, and its profitability well, they found the sweet, sweet spot right in the middle called sustainability. And they're well on their way to becoming a sustainable enterprise. So what is sustainability is the question. And my favorite quote about this, describing it, is that it's meeting the needs of the present generation without impacting the ability of future generations to meet their needs. It's pretty succinct. So then a sustainable enterprise is a company that's managing its triple bottom line with the goal of being able to meet its needs and not impact the needs of the future generations. And so as I was researching this, I was surprised to learn that the term triple bottom line dated back to 1994, 23 years ago. And to be sure, a lot of things have happened. Presidents have come and gone. But uh, uh, we're finally reaching a tipping point. So a recent report stated that half of the Fortune 500 companies are now uh, reporting on sustainability and environmental measures. And another report said that 81% of the S&P 500 are now uh, including sustainability reporting into their annual reports. So major companies have really embraced this idea, and now smaller companies are starting to embrace it as well. And that's why we're here today, to have a discussion about the triple bottom line and how social entrepreneurs can use this to strengthen our businesses and our community. And so again, I'm really grateful for y'all being here today and look forward to having this conversation. And so we really do want everyone to engage in this conversation, we have questions, but if you have your own questions, feel free to intermix those. Just if you do, if it needs a lot of background, you know, we can talk afterwards. But if you have questions that you can get out, we'd love to have those in here. So let's start out. We have an interactive exercise, and it's a doozy. We're going to get Justin Davis up here. And <laughs> we're going to attempt to define social entrepreneurship. And uh, to do that, we're going to have Dr. Justin Davis, an associate professor from the College of Business at UWF. Uh, his research includes organizational ethics, social capital, and various aspects of entrepreneurship and the innovation process. Justin. All right. So quick, uh, we have about eight minutes is what I'm told. So we're going to have to get, get down dirty fast. Um, you have a couple of, you have some note cards on your table you can use for making notes. I'm about to give you a short exercise. Um, real fast, social entrepreneurship is an extremely young field whenever we look at it relative to pretty much every other uh, category of business research. Um, as Jim mentioned a few minutes ago, even triple bottom line was until 1993. 24 years, that's, that's nothing uh, when we start looking at uh, developing research. Um, so part of the thing is there is no succinct and agreed upon definition of social, social entrepreneurship. And in fact, uh, what we might find today is that even in this room, um, there may be, however many people there are, there may be 47 different ideas of what we're really talking about when we're talking about social entrepreneurship. So the goal with this next seven minutes now is for us to come up, uh, to come to a at least understanding things that we can centralize on. Not that we're going to completely define it, but that we are all on the same page of what we're talking about uh, with these, uh, these uh, discussers uh, here in a few minutes. So. Here are, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to have these three tables in the back and then these two here. I want you to can discuss or write down, I want you to talk about what is the difference between social entrepreneurship, the way you would define it, and nonprofit organizations. On the other side, these three, I want you to talk about these specific distinctions between for-profit business and social entrepreneurship. And you can get down to single terms or a definition or whatever you want. It's very broad, but I'm going to let you run with it for just just three or four minutes. Say <laughs> <laughs> 
thinking the exact opposite. And, uh, and so it, it's kind of funny how we see we use this term and there's a lot of assumptions that we take with it, but it's kind of a, I don't know, there's, it's a, there's a lot of intangible stuff there. So if y'all can give us, you, know, you don't have to if you didn't come up with one, but if you can give us one takeaway that you had from your discussion related to, on this side, for-profit versus uh, social entrepreneurship, on this side, non-profit, um, let's hear it. So we're going to start back here. They're looking at me like, don't call us. <laughs> All right, let's start at the back. And you guys, go ahead and give us something. So um, some of our differences or for comparables was the social, the social side was uh, the innovation, the passion, and the drive, sort of a self-sustaining versus a dependent on the, on the side of the nonprofit. Hmm. So it, it may, you said <coughs> innovation and passion uh, as kind of drivers for coming up with them. Okay. Next. I think we agree. Same thing. <laughs> <laughs> Anything extra? Well, we talked about, not what we talked about, we talked about the difference between a nonprofit being 
there to address a specific social ill, mm -hmm. whereas a social entrepreneur is there to have, operates on a business model and uses the profits from that business model sometimes to address a social issue. Sure. But that there's a difference between a social entrepreneur and a business with a social, with a CSR program or a, those are two different things. Absolutely. So the, again, you're getting to where we get to social enterprise versus social entrepreneurship versus social innovation and corporate social responsibility, all these socials, and yet they really do have distinct uh, meanings. So we're getting to it. All right, what do you guys got? Well, we definitely echo the sentiments of those first two tables and say that uh, where we see the distinction is that uh, if you're looking at a nonprofit organization, it's based on a more that's addressing a social deal, but in a way that's more similar to uh, traditional charities, whereas social entrepreneurships uh, are built on top of an entrepreneurial framework, mm -hmm. but the only difference is they see the profit. Uh, they don't see profit as the bottom line, they see social outcomes. Okay. You, you, and actually, there was a little thing going through the three, of you, uh, three tables that the, one of the main differences we have between social entrepreneurship and nonprofit business is, is one in the development, the funding approach. Many times nonprofits are more dependent on a fundraiser, on some type of con you know, financial contribution, and their, their things are carried out dependent on that. Whereas social enterprise is an intentional effort to accomplish social good while basically creating funding itself. Um, <clears throat> the second is business model and how something is developed. And if we look at something such as you know, Tom's Shoes, um, that's not a business model that would work in a traditional for-profit organization, right? Um, it's also very different from being a traditional charity. And so it kind of found that in-between uh, in between area. All right, let's go to these three, and again, we'll start at the back. Um, you guys give us something, your difference between social entrepreneurship and then not a traditional company. Not everybody wants. Well, basically, the social enterprise goes to fund a mission, and for-profit is to... Make money. So it's about it's about stakeholder, right? Okay. What you? Um, so one of the points that came out at our table around the for-profit piece immediately was that uh, the for-profit the impression was that social entrepreneurship slash enterprise was just really for public relations reasons, mm -hmm. and as a customer or as a branding, as opposed to it having much more uh, other intrinsic types of reasons and values to it. Mm. So you're if saying. If it's done well, it will have the intrinsic reasons for it. Okay. That, let me make sure I understood that basically there is also, though, a tie between for profit business and doing social good for basically a different reason for financial gain. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I know Jim has lots of ideas. <laughs> <laughs> it was, she was our sport. I was taking the notes. Well, we, um, we looked more at the for profit. Mm -hmm. Which um, it can go e either way. It depends on the the nature of the company. And you earlier some cited Lamar Advertising, who is very environmental and people oriented. Where you may have another company that's just going to do rules, regulations, mm -hmm. um, Wall Street analysts, bottom line, telling them you need to cut this. So there's, I think, uh, you can't put all four profits into a category as making money is bad. Mm -hmm. So it's, I think you have to um, look at the individual for-profit organizations. What is, who, who is running it and what's the heart of the company? Mm -hmm. You bring, she brings up a really good point. We're going to wrap up with this, which is, where is that distinction she, she, between making she, she, money? Okay. She said we could hear it. Oh, you want to say it louder? Oh, I'm sorry. I have a soft voice. Would you say it when I she, said She was basically <laughs> saying that companies can accomplish, we can't really clump all companies into one specific category of you're for profit and you're not of social good. That companies, basically the way they carry out their business, what their mission is, um, that they can still be a successful impact change on, on social good, correct? That's a good way of putting it. Okay. Yeah. I summarized. I tried to. He summarized, yeah. You just because just something is for profit doesn't mean they're going to be bad for the environment and bad for the employee. You have to look at the nature of the company. And Jim opened up citing Lamar Advertising, yeah. who is good for the environment, consideration of their people. Uh, they have a, a fair business model in their sales. So, you know, you can't clump them with a company who's doing a slash and burn cutting based on a Wall Street um, 
profit analyst saying you're not going to make, make as much money. And so we have to get rid of this number, number of employees. So I don't think you can put for profit into as much of a general bubble as a lot of people would like to put them in. Yeah. That's my Yeah, public yeah. versus private. Public right. It, yeah. Not all, yeah. And in there we get to that, all right, corporate social responsibility versus social entrepreneurship. Um, and where it is a, in a within a company setting versus where it is a startup or something that began with the intention of a social good. Um, so it comes to something you were alluding to. Um, anyway, you're probably more confused about the definition of this before we started. Um, but the, the intention was that you start thinking of things differently. Where can we categorize these things? Because some of these definitions of the way we, we view them are important for, what, for when we try to begin uh, kind of positioning our minds or making decisions based on what the actual goal is. So I'll turn it back over to Jim. Thank you so much, Justin. So the panelists will come on up. We're going to go ahead and get into this. So the whole idea of this interactive exercise, I do. You have a name and everything. And the reason for that, thank you for inviting me, is that I know you have questions sometimes for a panelist, and I always go, what was that person's name? Here's their names, in order, from left to right. So if you have a question, you don't have to just point. You can say, Jill, what does that mean? And then also, just for reference, I put up the, uh, a couple of acronyms that tend to get thrown around, the three Ps and the triple bottom line. So, I'm still Jim. <laughs> okay, so, all right. So we really do want this to be interactive. Uh, I'll, the less I talk, the more of a win it is for everybody, right? So uh, we, we had the same panelist here about, a, what, probably a month ago, a little bit over a month ago, and I'm hoping lightning strikes twice today because we just, I think we had a great time. I think actually people learned something, which is kind of scary, uh, but maybe that can happen again. And so, uh, Let's go ahead and get started. I touched briefly on this in the presentation. I'm sorry, we'll get started. You want to Would you like to introduce yourself, Mr. Sure. Um My name is Haris Salibashic. I'm a, a professor at the uh, University of West Florida. I teach uh, political economy, ethics, uh, budget, and finance classes. I'm so glad to hear somebody at the university interested in sustainability, corporate social responsibility. So Justin, you and I need to talk. Um, <laughs> I moved here from West Michigan, actually from Grand Rapids, West Michigan. In August of last year, I've been teaching at UWF uh, prior to that. Um, my research is in um, the area of uh, interconnection between sustainability in public and private sector, climate, climate preparedness, climate resilience, and um, I also write a lot about ethics and organizational and administrative evil, which is a doozy, but it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> and you had a couple of conferences and papers recently, Yes, right? uh, so I, I presented at a uh, conference in Brazil, uh, England, on uh, sustainability and, and climate change. So somewhat knowledgeable about this topic. So, <laughs> thank you, Harvey. Jill? My name is Jill Thomas. I'm the Chief Marketing Officer at Industry <coughs> Hotels, which owns uh, about 20 hotels on the Gulf Coast. Um, I also head up their Corporate Social Responsibility Program, and I founded their so corporate social responsibility program. I have a long and varied um, history in the field of sustainability. I have a master's in environmental studies and have worked for many nonprofits over the years, including coordinating a coalition of 25 NGOs that were involved in land use planning in British Columbia, um, the outcome which was saving 25 million hectares of old growth rainforest on the coast of British Columbia. Wow. Um, I coordinated a coalition that involved forest companies and First Nations, and it was a hair raising experience. Um, so, um, yeah, so I don't know what else to say. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for leaving it only being a hair raising experience. Passing the closure. Uh, my name is Daniel Jacobs. Um, I'm director of strategy and engagement for a company called Five Point. Uh, we're based in, in Gulf Breeze. We're a strategic services company. Uh, we work predominantly with purpose-driven companies, so organizations that are trying to do better. And that, broadly speaking, overlaps nicely with the uh, 
the social entrepreneurship definition or triple bottom line, however you, however you approach it. Um, my background is in sustainability and corporate social responsibility. I came into it a slightly different way. I came into it as an engineer um, 15, 20 years ago um, was where I started. I went to school um, and I was an en engineer working natural fiber reinforced composites. Um, there would not be this many people in a room if it was a conference on natural fiber reinforced composites. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so started to think about ways in which we can actually tell the story a little bit better about these, about these materials. And uh, long story short, that led me to come over to the US about 2009. I worked in corporate sustainability um, for a long time. Then I worked for Saatchi and Saatchi as a director of strategy and engagement for Saatchi and Saatchi in San Francisco, working across the world on big projects for big multinational clients and then also non-profit NGO clients too. I came here to Pensacola a couple of years ago, been exploring this little topic since. Our clients are predominantly further flung the field than here in Pensacola, we're excited to have a conversation. And uh, yeah, last big project was really Super Bowl 50, host community with, um, in San Francisco, so a couple of Super Bowls ago. So um, excited to be here, thanks Jim for putting it all together. And uh, yeah, morning. Thank you. Thank you. the star of the show. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, first, thanks for everybody to be here. I'm glad everyone's here. As I said last time we came together, I was 10 years ago, if we would have announced this, there would have been three people in the room. So I'm very excited about the growth of this subject in this area. Obviously, living where we live, in this beautiful place we live, this is a very important, um, important subject. So my name is Mona. I am a president and founder of ID Group. We are a branding and change management firm located in downtown Pensacola. Um, I first became interested in this topic of sustainability around 2002, 2001. Most specifically, I you know, came just intrigued with companies like Ben and Jerry's, uh, Stoneful Farms, um, Body Shop, and these companies that seem to be doing great, amazing things for the environment and making some money. Right? So the more you study these companies, the more you realize this, is, this was born in the DNA of those companies. The founders founded those companies with a, that purpose intended. My interest became very much around, but how do you change the rest of the world? <laughs> how do you take a company not born with that DNA embedded and change them, which led me back to a PhD in change management, uh, into a company by the name of Interface, and a long relationship with that company, uh, along with um, Stoneful Farms, Green Mountain Coffee, really studying how you embed values of sustainability and culture. So today, my passion and my research um, with Interface was really about how do we do this? And what I've become increasingly kind of reconnected with, to be really frank with you guys, when I did this research back in 2003 and 4, I'd walk in the room and talk to people about this, and they'd be really nice, and I'm sure when I walked out, they were just shaking their heads, you know, like, bless their heart. Um, and when this happened, we know what that means. Uh, but, you know, I, and I really kind of got away from it. For, for several years. Um, I've re-engaged with it probably the last five or six years in really understanding there is, to your point, Jim, a tipping point going on. Uh, Ray Anderson used to say, the world will follow when the customers tell them where to go. Mm -hmm. And there is an increasing passion and purpose, not only around consumers, but employees around this topic. And so I have kind of re-engaged with it, re up the research, writing a book, okay? It'll be out in December, I promise. Uh, around how do you embed um, the values of sustainability into the culture of the organization. So um, that's why I'm here, and I'm just really excited to see all of you guys here and happy to have a conversation with these amazing people uh, and, and see what we can learn today, together today. Thank you. I learned something about each of these people every time they open their mouth, so it's, <laughs> I have no idea that you had done that, you had done that, you had done that. Anyway, very good. So, Patrick, uh, how's the volume back there? Do we need to? Project. If the volume is kind of competing with this uh, air conditioning, air conditioning yeah. system. Okay, so we'll need to project a little. And it's cold. So we'll project a little bit. So. All right. So let's go ahead and get started. So we've kind of touched on this. Uh, let's talk about why companies, large and small, are starting to focus on the triple bottom line as a way of doing business. And if you have any specific examples, please do feel free. So Daniel, let's start with you. 
So, um, I guess the other way of looking at that question is why not? If we want it to be even better, you know, <laughs> sneaky about it. Um, I think why is because folks have seen that it works, that it does make a difference. I mean, you, you referenced earlier some of the uh, S&P 500 um, statistics, and you know, I think broadly speaking, it's about an 18% return hike if you know, organizations that have embraced these kind of <coughs> approaches and principles. Um, and not only have embraced them, but are actually acting on them and reporting on them. Um, that becomes a tricky question to answer if you're in a shareholder meeting and you see folks that are achieving 18% higher return as to why you're not doing it. And they're usually good questions to kind of inspire a CEO to start thinking about what they can and can't do or why they should or shouldn't do something. So organizations are starting to see the benefit and I think consumers are starting to respond. I think to Mona's point is a great one that the consumer will, will lead. But there's also got to be a market there for folks to respond, respond to. And I think early adopters are showing that it can be done. Organizations are building phenomenal businesses and business models using these kind of approaches. And then the big companies, the S&P 500, are reporting far better returns through adopting it. So you kind of get to the point where the question does become a little bit more why not rather than, than why. But um, so for me, they're all, they're all the good reasons for some great examples are a big company of Microsoft, not traditionally thought of, but very innovative, um, change-driven company, and trying to drive the change within their, within their own organization, have an internal carbon tax that they apply to projects. So um, when you look at what the outcome is going to be and what the operational cost is going to be internally, then they actually apply this internal carbon tax to try and level out some of the, the challenges that can come from the accounting procedures of trying to achieve this triple bottom line approach when dollars don't always translate across all three aspects. So organizations are starting to do it. There's some good things happening, some great leaders in the space who we're fortunate to be able to point to and say is good examples. Absolutely. Mona, were you pulling out a statistic? No, I, I just <laughs> want to, I do want to point this out to you guys if you're interested. There is a report that was recently, this is done by, uh, it's called um, Globescan 2016 report. Um, and it's an excellent kind of snapshot of what's going on with this whole mindset of sustainability. And they've studied it for, for a long time. But to, the, to your point, some of the companies that are considered leaders in this field that are worth studying from a case study standpoint, Unilever remains the top dog when it comes to sustainability efforts. And let me say this, the reason a lot of these people are looked at this, this uh, by experts is because they measure it. It's not just about talking about it, but they use m metrics to measure uh, how, um, how, to define, how they define their sustainability. So Unilever, Patagonia, Interface uh, remains at the top, Ikea, Tesla, Nestle, Natura. So these, these, are, these are the leaders uh, as experts look at who's doing it right. A key factor, and of course one of the things that my, search, my research is really interested in, is that, that line between who a company says it is and what it does, okay? And then how do you measure what it is they say they are doing? So these are some of the leaders in the field um, when it comes to, to that. So this is a really good report, just as a, if you haven't studied it a lot or you're interested in the research, it's an excellent, um, excellent report. Excellent. Uh, Hart? So uh, to add to that point, uh, um, I come from a public sector. I actually used to direct the Office of Energy Sustainability and Legislative Affairs for the City of Grand Rapids in Michigan. The city won uh, two major uh, sustainability awards nationally and internationally, so among uh, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce uh, Most Sustainable City Award and the U.S. Conference of Mayors Climate Change Award. Uh, that was all during my tenure, and one of the things that really mattered uh, for the organization, for the community, was to measure and report uh, anything related to sustainability. Actually, the city of Grand Rapids was the only city in the U.S. that adopted a sustainability plan in place of, of the strategic plan, where all of the uh, sustainability planning uh, and budget efforts were combined into a, a, a five-year or ten-year uh, target-driven plan. Uh, so. Um, Corporations in uh, West Michigan, so I bring West Michigan, that's where I come from, and West Michigan had, for 20 years now, uh, West Michigan Sustainable Business Forum, where companies like Mway, Steelcase, Hayward, Herman Miller, you probably heard some of these, um, Cascade Engineering, they do sustainability in their uh, daily operations. 
so I'll just share with you, and I'll, I'll make sure that Jim gets a report on triple bottom, tri triple bottom line report from Cascade Engineering that has um, basically committed uh, its resources, and that's another factor in, in being successful in, uh, in this kind of environment to, to really implement stability in organizations. You have to commit resources. Uh, Cascade Engineering is committed to um, uh, corporate social responsibility through uh, addressing environmental issue and social issues. So the, uh, in, in, a, in a true sense of corporate social responsibility, Cascade Engineering had in its uh, annual report talked about uh, racial uh, issues and, and committed to hiring minorities, uh, hiring immigrants, hi hiring people with dis dis from disadvantaged communities, ver veterans and so forth. Um, I think that's the key where um, in, uh, big corporations may have more resources to have sustainability planning director or sustainability director. Um, and some don't have that, especially uh, medium sized and smaller organizations. They may not have funding to hire a person, but if it becomes embedded in organizational culture, which I'm sure uh, Mona is going to be talking about in her book, and I look forward to buying it, okay. <laughs> um, the, uh, then uh, the, the Sustainability becomes ingrained and embedded in, in, in those organizations. So uh, I just want to bring some of these examples that are not major corporations, but they're major players in the sense that they are committed to sustainability. So Cascade Engineering maybe has, I don't know, 600 em employees. Uh, they do, uh, they have a waste management cart production uh, section, and they, they also have water filtration uh, business, uh, their B Corporation, they, they actually annually renew their B, B Corporation status. So uh, in my, you know, my research, my study, I always look at what is the uh, government's role and what is the business role, where they, there's always um, this tension that governments should not be telling businesses how to do business, and I agree with that. Uh, but I, I see where sometimes, like in West Michigan especially, uh, businesses push government to do more sustainable work and government in return does the same thing and there's this perfect, uh, almost perfect uh, marriage between private and public sector to do sustainability in a true sense uh, where both uh, private sector organizations and public sector organizations, they have sustainability plans, they measure them and they report them. So I think we've already, this is uh, moving quick. The idea of metrics and measurement has come out, I think, three times already. So, Jill, why don't you kick us off with, like, how does Innisfree measure the triple bottom line? I'm going to step back just sure. a tiny bit. Please. Because the first question is, why focus on a triple bottom why? line? And it reminds me of a story when you were talking about the rainforest thing, right? So there's this giant rainforest on the coast of British Columbia, biggest in the world, and there's a whole bunch of organizations working on protecting it. And but in order to have legitimacy at the government table, we had to raise $500,000 to have scientists come up. So we did that. And we brought these like world-class conservation biologists up there and basically told them what parts of the rainforest we wanted to protect and then told them to give us science to back that up. <laughs> and it worked. And that was a super valuable learning lesson for me when I was like 25. And it's the same thing now. The reason we do triple bottom line in companies is because it's the right thing to do. And if you have money, and you have influence, and you have power, I believe you have a moral obligation to use that wisely and do something good for the world with it. Okay? So that's why we do triple bottom line. But we have CFOs, and we have presidents, and we have bankers, and we have all kinds of other people, and we need to take them to the Rainforest Valley and tell them why they need to save it. And for that, we need to give them numbers. <laughs> right? So, you know, at Innisfree, we started our triple bottom line work way before we ever thought about why or how we'd measure it, right? And our CSR program is only two years old, and we don't know how to measure it, to be honest. You know, we write a report every year, and we say, these are the great things we did in the world, and we think this is the impact that it's having, and then I make a whole bunch of statements about how our employees are probably more engaged <laughs> Probably like working there more. <laughs> you know, and then anything, sometimes some things come along. We get to pitch an RFQ because we were a sustainable company and they wouldn't let us pitch that RFQ if we weren't. That came up recently and I, you know, said to our president, look at this, see, I told you. <laughs> right? So, but there are ways to measure these things, right? There's software now that can come out and measure metrics like employee engagement and 
um, employee turnover, which are the number one reasons for doing triple bottom line, is because it gives having a purpose. Everybody feels better in the world if they're working towards a purpose. We all know that. That's common sense. Um, and then it's just becoming an expectation with consumers, you know. But that is different for every every brand. Like with our brand, we have the Hilton and the Holiday Inn Resort and the Hampton and the Marriott. Right, we're a hotel management company. Nobody in the world knows what that is. Everybody thinks the Hilton owns the Hilton, yeah. right? So when we were looking at becoming a B Corp, does everybody know what a B Corp no. is? Mm -mm. A B Corp is um, a B Corp is a really cool system. The best I think for um, certifying a triple bottom line company, because anybody out there can go see it. I'm a triple bottom line company. Julian and I, the owner of our company, have had so many discussions about this because I'm from British Columbia and the expectations of what a triple bottom line company would have to do in British Columbia compared to Pensacola is huge. <laughs> so when I first got here, he was calling him a triple bottom line company. It was stressing me out. And I'm like, oh my gosh, you can't do that. We don't even recycle. <laughs> you know, so it's like, you have to decide for you what your metrics are going to be and how you're going to define it and how you're going to measure it year after year. Um, there are some ways to do it. You can measure employee. It's getting easier to measure, but it's it's not. I guess I'll just stop talking. But it's not. Um, it's not just cut and dry. You, it, everybody's different. And so for us, for instance, when we were becoming a B Corp, so I got dis distracted by that. To become a B Corp for one company, it costs about seventy five thousand dollars, right? <coughs> And it's a whole process that you have to go through. And I didn't think that industry was ready for that. Um, I didn't think we'd pass yet. I still don't. I think we have a ways to go before we're going to be ready for that because we got the Hilton and the Marriott and the Holiday Inn Resort, and they all have their own brand standards. And so the B Corp person was pitching to me. He's saying, you know, it'll really impact your customers. If you're a B Corp, you're going to get more business in your hotels. I'm like, in Orange Beach, Alabama, I don't think so. <laughs> right? So at that point, we're doing it because it's the right thing to do. And because we wanted to be an industry leader, and we want to be a business that's helping other businesses here learn how to do it. And we want to be part of the movement that is changing people's minds about how important it is, and to be a bit of a trailblazer in that way. So that's why we do it, and we're going to learn to measure it piece by piece. We measure the people part. We're better at the people part. Most triple bottom line people are better at the environment part, because that's kind of where it came out of. The, 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 uh, most of the companies that work on triple bottom line are focused on green initiatives. Um, so yeah, I don't know how to measure it. But let me add to what Jill's saying about the B Corp, because uh, I interestingly, um, you can go through the evaluation, the, the metric, like you, it's, it's like it takes four hours to sit and go through uh, and answer those questions, right? Mm -hmm. And you will get some insight. Um, even if you choose not to continue with it, it's a really good eye opener yeah. for you to understand what the world <coughs> defines as a corporate responsible company. So you can so define benchmarks. You can find benchmarks. You can understand, like ID Group, you know, ranks like up here mm -hmm. on the social, and I won't even tell you how bad we are on the environmental piece of it. I mean, truly, yeah, we're because saying. you you know, it's just it's not the way a branding firm typically thinks as your you know your, as, as as far as your uh, supply chains go and. You know how you're, you're using the ink cartridge and this and this, but we're going to work on it. And so this is another thing that I think is easy um, that I learned early on for some of these pioneers in sustainability. This isn't a guilt trip. <laughs> this is not a guilt trip. This is about becoming. This is intention, and this is incremental progress and movement. And so sometimes when you hear all these people talk, it's about, oh, you're bad and you're good. It is, I think, to Jill's point, it is your intention to do good. It is your intention to be responsible, to be a citizen of the world, okay, a citizen of the world, and then to incrementally do what you can to move in that direction. So I think sometimes it <coughs> get overwhelming and it's like, oh my goodness. You know, so it's like, I love the B Corp because it gives you a framework. <coughs> the second thing it does is it gives you a path. You can decide the path to get you from point A to point B. But I will also say, what the research is showing increasingly is this. People who are millennials, Gen Xers, are making decisions on who to work for because of the responsibility perspective of a corporation. There's no more question about that. That's not even, that's not even, there's no need to talk about it, it's fact. The second piece of this is consumers 
are also making those choices. So give me the employees who are saying, I want to work with you versus you because you have a purpose, to your point, whatever that purpose might be around the environment and social piece of it. And then the, and, and then people are choosing <coughs> to purchase from those people. So when I say the consumer will take tell you where to go, the consumer is telling you where to go, as are these young people who are looking for jobs. So the rest and the brightest are looking for that. Well, you had said something before that I really liked, which was that if you're not doing this, you're not going to be here. That's what I think. Yeah. I truly believe that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that if we want to talk about competitive, if you want a business case, uh, and we don't have time to talk about it, but we can give you a business case for it. There is, the business case is very, very strong for this. Um, and again, like Jill says, I think you've got to come, if you come at it only from a business case, you don't get it. Okay? If you come at it because it's a belief system that you believe this is the right things to do, ethics, you know, that's what it comes to. It's like old-fashioned <laughs> ethics, business ethics, you know, it's the right thing to do. But there's a business case for it. It's we a can smart give you thing the business do. case when you need it. Yes, <laughs> yes, <laughs> absolutely. It goes like if you can get a search for the rainforest, you know, we can give you the business case. But it really has to be something that somehow inside of you, you wake up one day and say, I'm going to do it this way because it's the way I believe, it's what I believe in. Very good. So I'm thinking about how to ask this question. And what I really want to get at is like, so, so there's some people in here that are actually actively working toward being social entrepreneurs, right? And there's others that are really close to being able to make that decision to say, I think I might be a social entrepreneur. <coughs> What's the first step, Daniel? So like, Daniel, in your company, do you mentor people through this process? Or how exactly does that work? <coughs> yeah, we do. Um, you know, I, I think the only thing I would caution a little bit, I, I agree with Mona completely that to have that drive and that passion is incredibly, incredibly important. Um, but there is going to be that boulder and you either have to present the, you know, where you're going to increase drive revenues or you're going to cut costs. Um, otherwise, okay. not get to, yeah, it's going to get tough to get over that hurdle. But um, yeah, really, we, we, we have a process, five point, we like to kind of distill things down into fives. Um, just makes it a little bit easier to digest there. Um, and so one of the one of the approaches we have, we call it water. Um, and really it starts with the, the what are you going to do and who are you doing it for. And quite often it's the easiest step, but it's the one that's most overlooked. It's establishing why you're doing what you want to do and then who you're doing it for. And if you're not asking yourself, who am I doing this for, when you ask the question, why are we doing what we're doing, then you're probably not going to build a very robust program. Because if you're doing it just for you, that it's going to be great for you, but it's probably going to miss out a couple of the other lines that are on the bottom there, are part of the triple bottom line approach. Mm -hmm. So understanding what you're going to do and who you're doing it for is super, super important. And that's really the first place to start. What do you want to do and who are you doing it, who are you doing it for? And then we can start to go through kind of the, the rest of the acronym. When we start thinking about alignment and agreement, so we start thinking about do we have everybody on board that we need in order to accelerate and execute on this program? And then T, do we have the targets and the tactics in place? Do we have the right goals that we know that we're aiming for? So we know what we're going to measure so that we can talk about those things. And do we have the tactics to enable us to do that? And each of these is just individual processes. And then once you get to E, by the time you get to E, and it's a case of execution and engagement, and it's about just putting everything into practice and engaging the folks that who, who you were most worried about in the first place. So you've got them on board and now you can involve them in the conversation and they become your biggest, biggest advocates. And then finally it's recording and reporting. Because we get to the end sometimes and we sometimes forget to record. That's the Jill's <laughs> point. Yeah. Like the people that have the data are the ones that are really useful. But on the same token, it's really good to have all the data. But unless anybody knows you have all the data, well they can understand the data. <coughs> you kind of have meaningless data. So being able to report that in a way that makes sense to folks. And again, who are you doing this for? It's brilliant to have huge amounts of carbon data. But if it doesn't mean anything to your ultimate consumer, then all you have is just mounds of data. But if you can convert that into a story that makes sense to your customer, or a value proposition that gives you a better entry point to a supplier, or a differentiator point between a competitor, now you've got something that's valuable. 
now you've proved out the process and you can start again somewhere else. So for us, we consider it, we call it water just because it's an easier acronym to work out, but there's very distinct steps. And the interesting thing about those distinct steps is it's not specific to social entrepreneurship. It's not specific to the triple bottom line. It's just good business. <laughs> like if you do it this way, if you achieve, if you take business decisions based on these five steps, it's just better business. But by doing this, you can incorporate all of the other things that matter to you, like the community, the societal side of things, your, your customers, your emissions, whatever it may be, you can build all those in. And if you follow those five simple steps, you actually start to move in the right, move in the right direction. And it's not doing anything that you guys don't do a thousand times a day every time you make a business decision. I, I just want to uh, add to uh, Daniel's point is that in terms of uh, factors that determine or push organizations into sustainability direction, uh, you have, as you both pointed out, uh, you have these external factors, customers and competitors, you really want to be uh, doing better than your competitors. But there's also this internal uh, dynamic, and especially in my, in my uh, previous life uh, experience, uh, there's uh, the, the factor of a lot of employees now do demand sustainability to be uh, in, in, ingrained within the organization, and they look for jobs where sustainability is part of the uh, organizational dynamic. Um, and then there's this idea of uh, top-down uh, leadership where uh, oftentimes you have CEOs and CFOs and they really want to see sustainability be part of that organization. And I found that to be very important. Uh, you know, I, I do have to say this, when I did sustainability in practical terms, I always had to show business case which may seem very counterintuitive if you work for the government, but I could not uh, tell uh, commissioners and, and the mayor and, uh, and appointed officials that uh, uh, putting 29% uh, of renewable energy project on several uh, city-owned buildings uh, is just a fun and socially good thing to do. I just had to the right show. Thing to do, just do it. I had to show. <laughs> so I, I want to caution on that because in practical terms, you can all have good intentions, but you have to show business case in addition to saying, okay, here's the environmental benefit, here's the CO2 reduction benefit, and here's how you may help uh, some of these companies that do renewables in Michigan or Florida if we're doing solar. So. I just want to be uh, be realistic and pragmatic because I, I, as I said, I have I had 14 years of sustainability experience before I joined the UWF, and, and truly you had to balance social, environmental, and primary economic in all of our uh, sustainability plans. Economic benefits were first and foremost. Interesting. I agree 100 percent on the business. Case. I didn't want to make sure you didn't think that I was being cavalier about that because you won't succeed if you don't have a business case. Um, but one of the interesting things about business cases, we all know about you know, the employee engagement, we know with sustainability sometimes you can save money on resources and that kind of thing. Um, but one of the things that I found interesting as a business case is innovation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you're trying to do something in a different way than the standard because yeah. you're trying to do something better for the planet or better for, for the environment, then you have to innovate your processes because you don't have a boss in the world that's going to go, yeah, sure, I'm totally fine with that costing 40% more than it would if we did it the unhealthy way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? So, that's true. So no, you that's have, true. You have to innovate. True. So yeah. that brings you back down to the company survival because thinking, else, thinking like this forces a company to embrace figure innovation it and figure it out differently, which is a really important thing in today's business environment where things are moving so quickly. Yeah, and I want to, I just, I'm so glad you brought that up because when we were doing this original research with Interface, here's what we found. Between like 2000 and 2000, 2004, Interface, this, and your storytelling I think is important too, right? So Interface had gotten to the point where they were telling their story, right? They were kind of like the sustainability rock stars back in the day. And that also put pressure on the organization to keep up and the ante, right? So Interface had to constantly move those those metrics. They had because they were out telling the story about them. They were careful not to get let their walk get too far in front of their talk, but the, or their talk in front of their walk. But that pressure made a, a huge, huge difference in 
in all of that. And so I think, you know, the, the, the piece of this from an innovation standpoint, Interface catapulted, and I think we could probably, between all of us, talk multiple things of product innovation that came out of a requirement to reduce the, the impact on the environment. Huge, huge, huge. So I, every company that I have studied has found innovative ways to solve the problem, right, the, the challenge of proving sustainability, and as a result, were able to get in front of the market. So the investment piece of this, while yes, requires investment, it also, the return on that investment oftentimes is in terms of innovation, um, uh, you know, Jill. So I think, thank you for saying that, because I think it's a huge piece of, of this. Very good. This is a very specific question, and one I just kind of came up with, but I think it's gonna tie into the story, but I don't know that for sure. So, uh, Part of the idea of social entrepreneurship includes this idea of social employment, right? Employing people that may not otherwise be able to get a job. And it's not always the case, as you've heard, there's environmental aspects and some people are better at people, some people are better at planet, some people are better at profit. Uh, so there's a balance, but if you're doing the social employment side and you're employing people that may not be very attractive to your customer, how do you get past that and like get the story out there that you're doing a good thing and you're doing it for the right reason? I'm you know, looking at Mona, but I know I'm trying to. I'm trying to um, <laughs> it's a yeah, very specific uh, question. Uh, to be completely transparent, I haven't worked in specifically um, in, in that. I think any story with an authentic reality is a story that will be attractive to people. Not to everyone, and not to every situation, <coughs> Jim, but I think you know, one of the keys I'm sure all of us would agree on here is you just can't fake this. You just can't fake it. And you can't do it for a purely, um, you know, to look good, for pure PR, for pure anything. So I think any story born from the heart of truth, born from the heart of real purpose, is a story that people will 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 gather. Not everybody, because every story is not going to connect with everyone, right? Mm -hmm. So I think it has to come from that authentic place. It has to be truth, and it has to be told with a passion and a belief that um, that will connect with people. I don't know if that answers your question. I think it gets to. The, I know there's specific examples in the room of that, but I'm also, you know, mm -hmm. as, as I think all of y'all know, we're, I'm working on this project and. Uh, some of the people that we want to employ are unable to get jobs elsewhere, and it's like, so how do we get over this which, hurdle? Which side are you getting over? Getting the people or getting... Getting the people is easy, because they're not currently able to work. Okay. But it's getting the public to accept the fact that they're going to be coming... you got to build a case, like anyway. Yeah, so not just a business case, but a... Human case. A human case. Yeah. For us, um, we actually work <coughs> with um, some folks who fit that criteria. Um, former NBA basketball player, turned, I think, largest fraud convict in California. Um, one was more successful than the other one. Um, <laughs> and Seth, um, Seth was um, in prison in, in Texas and um, was working in the, I'll give you a bit of his back, bit of his back. he was working in the commissary and um, went to get food, to prepare the food for the, for the fellow inmates. And one of the boxes had uh, not for human consumption, printed on the side of the side of the box. And that was kind of the turning point for Seth and his buddies in there in there in that system. So they really kind of went into the kitchen. They kind of scrabbled around, got everything they could that was even remotely remotely healthy, and created this little granola bar and started selling it, quote unquote selling it in the uh, in the prison system. And then when Seth came out with really nothing except some of these granola bars that he he'd made. Um, and he kind of worked on the principle, hey, if I can sell this in prison, I can probably sell this elsewhere. So we've worked with Seth for the last little while on his, on his story, and some of these you know, questions come up um, regularly, like why, why Seth? Um, why his granola bar over, over others? I think, broadly speaking, folks do want to help as long as there's an understanding of where they fit within a story, and if it's an open and transparent case. So, um, you know, being open about Seth's story and his journey 
about what he's learned and what he's able to share, about what he's doing and why he's doing it, about his desire to essentially create a sales workforce across the country of folks who are formerly incarcerated to do that too. All of those things are really powerful um, pieces to the narrative. Now, for some folks, it actually works the other way. It work, completely works the other way. But I think for, um, when you're in that situation, you kind of have to understand that that's going to be the case and just try and remain as positive as you can and focus on the core, the core message. Um, you know, we have Seth's great. We have a little bit of humor with Seth too, which helps kind of diffuse some of it too. The bars themselves are called prison bars. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, criminally delicious. <laughs> <laughs> We've got more. We've got more. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do you want to step into that? Well, this is an interesting one when it comes down to business model, right? Because it depends on your business model. Well, obviously, it's more of a challenge for Mona, who is running a digital agency, to hire a non-traditional workforce in the <coughs> industry, which it's quite easy for us to hire a non-traditional workforce. And it's just a matter of focusing on that. And that's we focus on it a lot. We have um, we have AIM. We work with AIM. And again, this is not totally my department. It's um, human resources. But we've had uh, you know kids that are tr you know struggling with um, incarceration. We've been training them to be maintenance people in our hotels. Um, we have a program specifically designed for, uh, I don't know what it's called when you first get out of jail. Probation. Yeah, for people who are just recently out of jail. Um, so, yeah, pardon? <laughs> yeah, so I, I, you know, and, and we have a blog, and we write about that on our website and tell their stories all the time. Uh, we also work with, uh, the Independence for the Blind, and we have a reservation officer at the uh, Hilton who is a who uh, is, is he blind. He's amazing. And he's <laughs> funny. It really is. I should just tell a funny little story about him. He uh, he met this blind woman, and they've been dating for three months, and they were about to get married, and then. Uh, he had, he had Julian and Kim, he says, we have a big problem, right? And after three months, he just realized that his wife was uh, black, and it turns out that he's a, he was having a hard time with the idea of marrying a black person. It took him like three months to figure it out. <laughs> so uh, Julian and Kim had to do some counseling with them. <laughs> um, yeah, so I just tell the story with heart. I think, yeah. you know, that's what we do. We just don't worry about it. The people who don't connect to that, the people who... You know, just get a question with you if whether they're your number one customer base. Mm -hmm. You know, I just want to add to this because I, in my studies and research, uh, corporate social responsibility and this type of uh, activities is less common than environmental and other types of activities. You look at companies; they really have to commit themselves fully to to help non traditional workforce, and that's something that. I think we may need to be seeing even more in, in, in the future because I rarely come across, you know, a, a company that really commits resources to hiring uh, those who came out of prison recently. Or to, they may be, you know, writing here and there that they're committed to diversity and hiring, you know, minority and women on, uh, or even in their supply chain to hiring minority <coughs> and women on enterprises. But that's uh, less of a common theme in corporate social responsibility than uh, other factors, which is usually environmental and um, yeah. feel good yeah. type of uh, activities. And but it's a bit harder. It's harder. Yes, We're it's harder. You, you really have to commit to that. With our business model, it's a little bit easier. But we actually have diversity commitments, you know, and, that's, that's, and they're hard to achieve when we're working mm -hmm. towards them. Like, and that is one thing you can measure. Yeah. You know, how many women do you have in your executive suite? Mm -hmm. How many are you bringing up the pipeline? Um, you know, how many people of you know, color, how many people of different nationalities do you have coming up your, in your leadership, um, your leadership pipeline and stuff like that? That's something where we're mm -hmm. working on more. That's, we're stronger on that than we are on um, the environmental stuff, to be honest. Yeah. It's more of our focus. Well, I think that's good because, I mean, as even as looking for examples of social entrepreneurship locally and abroad, it's much harder to find people, the people bottom line, than it is to yeah. find the planet. Well, that's so. something that's special to Pensacola, though, yes. right? Yes. That's why we're that way, is because we're rooted in this community and that, that mm -hmm. resonates with this community more, it resonates with our founder more, you know, than, than the sustainability part does. doesn't mean we don't care about the environment, I'm not saying that. 
but it's just, you know, it's like you can't do it all. Like, that's what really good thing to think about is triple bottom line. Like, think about where your community is and what is your business model. What makes sense for your business model and your community, and those are the things that it's easier to focus on, right? And so for us, the, the people part makes more sense, given where we have a lot of people who work for us who live below the poverty line. You know, and what can we do for them in terms of what's more important, recycling or trying to figure out how to end generational poverty with a third of our employees, you know, by starting daycare systems. Like, that's our dream, right, at Innisfree, is to have some kind of close the loop <coughs> with our employees so that we can provide everything that they need while they're working for us to help them end generational poverty. You know, so whether it's health, you know, having a health clinic on site and having uh, early childhood education on site, that would mean much more to our business. And in the end, that would bring us way more profit if you think about it. Because if you think about, say, housekeepers are our number one issue in a hotel management company. They're very difficult to recruit, they're difficult to keep, um, especially when you have beachfront properties because housekeepers don't live on Pensacola Beach. They don't live on Orange Beach and their travel to work is very difficult. Right, so if we could close that social gap, you know, so we're thinking of starting the industry family center where you know, they could come and they could, you know, drop off their kids and then their kids would have daycare and a great school and medical attention and everything they need to do and coaching and all that kind of stuff that they need in order to overcome those barriers and then a lift to work. What housekeeper is ever going to quit their job if they have that? Yeah. Right? So these are the kinds of, that, but that's based on our business model. Jill, that is so important because that's where you start is what makes sense to you because we can give you all these textbook definitions of what sustainability is and what it's not, but when you take the business case and you take still the what's important to the ownership of the company, who, what's important to the ownership, and what's important to the people of the company, and then how you put all of that together is unique for every single company. And that's why I say B Corp is a phenomenal framework, framework, but it may not suit you or Innisfree or ID Group or any university or Westport, they not do that. So it's really important, you know, what happens is we're going to do it. <coughs> we're going to do it, whatever it is, right? So the, the issue here is spending enough reflective time to really think about the why mm -hmm. before you do the what. Because the why says this is why I am doing this. This is why this is important. And the answer I have as ID group may not be your answer, but the why has to do with what we leave our grandchildren and their grandchildren and how we contribute in some positive way to making it a better world. So I think, you know, that is such a right on example of, wouldn't that be a phenomenal thing? <laughs> in generational poverty, oh my goodness, hello, I'm, a, I'm in, you know. So those are the things that I just want you to encourage is there's no, one size fits all. There is simply an intention to be a good corporate citizen, to be a citizen of the world and make the world a better place. Now, how do you use your business? How do you use it to do that? There's only one person that can answer that, and that's your business. I mean, that's just fact. So let's get into that then. Like, uh, There's a lot of different, do, first, does anyone have a business that they want to talk about, or you have a question? I, I, I had a kind of a comment. Sure. Uh, for Jill, um, a few years back, um, uh, Julian, I think, had already been working on this um, idea of being a social entrepreneur because he had 90 Works come in and provide uh, advocacy and enrollment in um, Florida Kid Care for your employees at the hotels. And I just thought that was um, a, a really ethical thing to do. Uh, and by the way, we are navigators of the marketplace now, so if you need any help with that, let me know. <laughs> yeah, um, that's where it all starts with your founders and your CEOs, right? Julian and Kim were social entrepreneurs before yeah. anybody knew what that was. Yeah. It's because it's in their heart. You know, they just think that work is worship, and that's, that's you don't work to make money. You work to make yeah. people and the places that we live better. Yeah. Right? And, and the other thing that your conversation has, uh, has got me thinking about is that, you know, we spend a lot of time at 90 Works helping people become self-sufficient. And we're working with very vulnerable populations, um, uh, that intergenerational poverty folks, and, uh, and homeless veterans and homeless families and, and lots of other high-risk groups. And, and you know, um, there are a lot of employers in this town 
who are willing to hire the folks that we work with, but no one's telling their story. And I thought, well, we need to start telling their story because um, you know they're they're taking that risk of working with the folks that are that, that are risky, but what, but could enhance their bottom line if pe other people know about it. Um, Changing the topic slightly, since we have three people up there who are international, I work for an international um, engineer architectural firm. We have 23,000 people across the world. We do amazing things in other countries. In the U.S., there's a little bit of a different mindset. Um, so we've got all of these sustainability papers, reports, resiliency, you name it, we're saving the world, but we're not in the top ten. So there's a different kind of mentality. So one, I wanted to see what are the challenges that you see in getting that U.S. mindset to get on to the we are a citizen of the world. And two, from an external part, U.S. Green Building Council, lead buildings, all of this fun, fun good stuff that's been going on for 10, 12 years, we can build those to the correct standards but the certifications are so freaking expensive that even though a building is completely gold certified, the client doesn't have the funds to pay for it. So then going to your RFP instance, we don't have the proof to show the RFP. So the question is one, how do you see the internal culture going a little bit more internationally? And two, the actual cost of getting our buildings and other things sustainable, I mean, obviously we build them to be sustainable, we don't build a building to fall down, but there's a different level and putting the bamboo, you know, floors down, the echo roofs and this sort of thing, the cost on that. Yeah. Do you want me to talk about international uh, loop? <laughs> <laughs> I, I agree with you. I mean, it's an issue that needs to be addressed in uh, public and private sector both uh, because when you look at the, uh, so I was in Brazil and everyone talks very positively about the United States and um, they, they always look at the United States as a leadership position. So I, I feel um, somewhat strongly about the environmental issues in this country because uh, if you look at Pensacola, Pensacola has such wonderful assets in terms of the environment, beaches and everything else. And yet it's very unprotected, let's be frank about it. I mean, it's. There are certain issues with brownfields, with um, air pollution uh, that are not being addressed. And I'm not trying to criticize, I'm just being frank. I'm actually speaking tomorrow night at 3.50 Pensacola about my climate resiliency research. So if you're interested, I think it's at the Senior Center, which is fun. I look forward to that. Um, <laughs> senior Citizen, this is where? Senior Baby. Center. Oh, Bayview. Bayview. Yeah, Bayview yeah. Senior Center. But uh, so when we, when we talk about international and uh, how do we attract I'm from Bosnia. I moved here a uh, long time ago. Uh, but I moved to West Michigan and I never felt unwelcome. I always felt like uh, my family, my mom and dad, they always had the job opportunities. They, uh, they, um, my two brothers, they all, we all got a master's degree and then I got a PhD. <coughs> uh, but one thing that always struck me is that this, um, there was always this element like, you're here, and when you're going back, kind of, kind of mentality, you know, is this just a temporary thing? And when when people move here, they really they put their roots down, and I feel like that's uh, even harder moving to Pensacola than it was for me. I, and I mean this in all seriousness. It was, it's a lot harder moving from Michigan to Pensacola than it was moving from Bosnia to West Michigan. So something to think about. I'm, I'm thinking about university too. Uh, I'm thinking about, you know, I, I, I was really struck when there were issues about immigration and how Michigan universities were sending out messages that they're supporting their international students, they'll take care of them. And I, there was a tiny blip of something about that in our, at our university. And I think that's important when, when you see messaging about welcoming communities because you, you really think about my son, my son played soccer uh, for uh, Bayside Tiger, so uh, Bayside, he, he loves soccer, but he loves it even more because um, 
the, the, uh, the diversity of the team that he has. He has team players who are Japanese Americans, uh, Brazilian, uh, Venezuelans. Uh, I mean, that, that to me is a big strength of the community when you have diversity, but diversity that's not just in, in words, but it's also embraced in, in a true sense. So that translates to corporate culture when you embrace and corporations that embrace international, um, not just because it's, it's good for the university or organizations and so forth, but it's good for bottom line that um, different opinions bring about positive change. And I think that's where uh, I, I learned, you know, I, I worked with private sector a lot, even though I was in a uh, public sector, I was a public sector employee uh, because I saw that they really value different opinions and, and um, you know, I, I, I won the uh, West Michigan Sustainable Business Forum um, uh, annual award uh, for sustainability, they call it sustainability champion. Because I, I believe that I was able to translate my, um, my philosophy in, in, in sustainability from one sector to another and um, I think the uh, the international experience that I brought was very valuable, and I, I, I was able to uh, to translate that to, to benefit in my past uh, universities where I taught in Michigan, my, my workplace, but also here. I'm sure that uh, I, what I bring is is going to benefit the university. So by having a more international workforce and a more inclusive uh, municipality, we're more likely to be. Success developing a sustainable uh, and mindset. And that's, that's, that's sustainability in a sense, yes. Right. Very good. Jim, um, I, I really have enjoyed all four of you. Jim, Jim. Um, <laughs> how does all of what you're talking about, how can you, how can we influence the current uh, uh, political environment, uh, given uh, that we're already impacting, the, the executive orders are impacting the environment, and all of these things, as well as how people are viewed. How can uh, nonprofits and for profits influence that? Yeah, that's a great question, and I think it is the question, right? And I think the very first step in answering that is this conversation, this room full of people is the beginning of, of how we influence <coughs> the legislation, the political environment, right? I, I'm pretty comfortable to say that uh, before our last lunch and learn, I mean, the word sustainability probably hadn't been used since the last Think Beyond meeting, right? So, <laughs> I mean, it's just not out there. So if you're doing social enterprise, then you could be the interface of Pensacola. You can be the, I forget what the name of that company was, but the B Corp that does engineering. Cascade, Cascade Engineering. Cascade Engineering. You could be that company here. And as more and more of us make that choice and start to do this, you know, we start to change the conversation. So that's my answer. I think more importantly than that is like especially with the recent administration, it's showing the power the business has mm -hmm. just to override right. the government yeah. and implement these things no matter who's in government. Mm -hmm. Like when Patagonia said, we're not going to the conference in Utah if you're like pulling out of the parks. Right. You know, yeah. and Starbucks said, we're going to hire refugees. You know, and cities have said, you know, we're, gonna, we're going to implement sustainability standards no matter, cities and businesses say we're going to implement, you know, sustainability standards no matter what the government says about climate change. And I, that gives me hope. You know, that's why I yes. love social entrepreneurship so much. And there's big conferences that I've gone to, like the Social Venture Institute and stuff, and you go to those conferences, it gives you so much hope because it's kind of like, who cares who's in the White House? We're, we've got this. Yeah. <laughs> the business has more power. As businesses, you have more power, especially in the United States, than government. But the United States is doing the least amount in terms of but not, you know, it's businesses aren't. But not businesses. Like, yeah. if you think about who's going to solve malaria in Africa, Bill Gates or UN? Yeah. I'm going to put my money with Bill Gates. <laughs> but you it's know? easier to do it, those kinds of things, because they're more measurable. Mm -hmm. You know, he could take his money to Africa or Sudan and measure how many people he pulls out <coughs> of poverty. I 
was <coughs> listening to an NPR show this morning, and they were specifically talking about why isn't he putting his money in to education here, or the things that need to be happening here. I'm not saying others are not important, but... But you know, here's, here, let me give you a film. So I was in an er, early book, College of Commerce, Paul Hawkins. And Paul Hawkins' preface back in, this would have been 95, or probably 96, was that there is nothing bigger, nothing more powerful than business. The world is going to change. If we're going to create a different reality for future generations, we are the people. It's not that. Yeah, Remember, sure. government is elected by us. So here's where I believe the real opportunity lies. I believe it lies inside of every company. The conversations that occur in every company. People to be willing to have these tough conversations. When I was sitting here talking thinking about design thinking, mm -hmm. right? The whole idea of design thinking and the power of engaging people inside your organization to come up with answers. Not top down, not bottom up, but collaborative. So within IP Group, right, we have 10 people, 11 people. This is a conversation that we have regularly. You think the people in my company don't walk out with a different perspective, right? A different kind of conversation. Part of my job as a CEO is to influence Part of my job is to educate. Part of my job is to inspire. Part of my job is to engage through this whole concept of learning cycles. How are we, how do we do it? What's the possibility? So I believe the answer begins with the cultures of the organizations, with leaders willing to stand up and say, this is what we're going to do, and this is how we're going to get, I need you to help me get there, but this is where we're going. And bring, keep the conversation going, because with conversation comes change. But if we all sit back and go, oh, somebody else needs to do that. Oh, I don't know. Then we're going to be sitting here where we may not be sitting here. Um, you know, and, and I think it's so important that Pensacola is such an amazing place, guys, that there are real issues here. Okay, poverty, education, pollution. See, I'm like a third generation Pensacola, so I can tell you. Okay, the fish that used to swim in Nine Mile Creek ain't there no more. Okay? So we gotta get real as a community to say, oh yeah, it's all beautiful, but what's un un beneath it? That's why I get so fired about this triumph money. And what's going on with triumph money, y'all get me there. But the point I'm trying to make here is the power is within each one of us, our ability to hear our, have our voices, and no fear. No fear of raising our voices. Okay, amen, sister. Yeah, that was a great <laughs> question, and unfortunately, we actually are out of time for this conversation, but Tom, actually, if you will lead us downstairs after this, there is a buffet filled with desserts and drinks. Do you and eat first? Is that what you're saying? You get to eat first. Can I eat first? You pay for it, you get to go first. But, uh, I'm sorry. What? We have time for one last question. Sure. Okay. Um, you buy desserts, you can ask questions. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. He wouldn't let me say it. Right. You're you're the the definitions of sustainability. Mm -hmm. um, considering that there is such a large retirement population in this area, um, I'm wondering if anybody has any thoughts of how one may be able to evaluate the quote narrative, the story of different organizations in the area where one could volunteer in these areas or look to evaluate um, you know, different organizations by way of donations from that population. That I think there's a lot of people looking on both sides either, where can I give my best time, <coughs> energy, and sometimes dollars? And I'm just wondering, um, uh, the panel has any particular thoughts, ideas, comments about that. Yeah, I've got a thought, but I'm open to anybody else's. So there's an organization called Pensacola, Pensacola Community Action Network, and that is one of the things that we've identified is that we have, I forget the actual number, but we tend to say 10,000 nonprofits in Pensacola, or in Northwest Florida, I should say, which sounds insane, right? And if that's not exactly accurate, I apologize. And so our, the organization was formed with the idea of let's become this structure that can provide fiscal sponsorship so they don't all have to go through the 501c3, but also let's start to create a database where people can come in instead of trying to find that one organization they care about, 
they can come in and say, this is what I care about, here's organizations that match. Mm. And so that's how we're trying to address it. It's a long-term goal, I think. We're still early, but that's how we're trying to address it. Does anyone else have any ideas on how we're doing that here? No? Yes. Actually, Keith? I, I think Keith there's up. a huge thing that's kind of going on right now, which is sort of the uh, uh, retired entrepreneur kind of thing happening. <coughs> there's a lot of that generation that um, is tired of just greeting doors at Walmart. And they are, they are moving into um, either helping people start businesses from what their experiences have been or starting their own businesses because of the need to supplement what isn't being funded by Social Security or retirement funds or 401ks or whatever. And through a lot of that, you're finding some great experience um, being collected. You're finding some really good stories and you're finding some people that have some really intuitive ways of, of us bringing the old back into the new and sort of working into the interfold of, of making change. And you're really finding out that um, some of the predisposition of uh, it's just some old dude doing something, whatever, is that you're finding some very innovative um, um, ways and, and people that are starting to try to get back to the communities in a different way. It's, it's here, it's happening. It's not every retired person, but there's a lot of it's probably a good resource to tap into. Thanks. Is there an old dude club or something? If I hear one, I will let you know. <laughs> Keith is part of our Tom's inspiration right from here. So. Yeah. We have a community no. garden, music, Friday yeah. night, $10. Come to that. Tell all the old dudes. It's wonderful. <laughs> So, um, so you know, last one, question. One, one, well, it's, it's kind of, okay, and it, this may be some, staging something for the next time you guys get together because that transition, that cultural change in an organization that has kind of evolved to a point, but it requires another revolution almost mm -hmm. to get on board with and, and understand this. Um, you know, we have a core value, giving back your time and treasure. And that was actually inspired by Julian. And uh, we've been hearing the triple bottom line for a long time and seeing what he's doing in schools and within his own community. Um, but we, we've tried that top-down approach. And you're not going to get everyone. You know, it's hard to harness the entire organization under one mission, right? You'll get some. You'll get a good portion. But we've kind of, to, to Mona's point, <coughs> We move from the bottom up to say, what's important to you? We're going to provide you the time and resource to engage in the community and make a difference organically. Uh, and uh, you know, we have a brag sheet that we throw up in our you know, mid-year and year-end meetings where we're sharing all of the, the, the brands that we are and the people and the organizations that we're impacting. You can't get it on one page. So you know, that's uh, the overall mission of, of a CEO can, can be very, you know, I believe in, this. Well, that leaves out a, a large population of your organization, so I'd be interested in maybe not this time, maybe another time, on how we go about engaging those others in the conversation so that everyone's doing their part, everyone feels that they're connected to the mission of the organization, but it's not the CEO's mission, right? Uh, so uh, it may be for, for the future. Uh, yeah, I think but, it's a great it's, topic. How do you transition? It's a great question. Let's uh, leave with that question and no, but not leave. Let's just go downstairs and continue as thanks to the panel. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Tom, leave the way. Yeah, I'm really good friends with Phil